When the pilot for Has Been Hotel dropped way back in 2019, you know, before someone unleashed the mummy's curse to begin the apocalypse, I remember quite enjoying it. The concept of an animated series set in hell, all about this parody of a Disney princess trying to redeem sinners, was quite compelling, especially as an animated project that was specifically for adults without feeling soulless like most adult animated sitcoms, and likewise featuring an incredibly unique art style that was honestly right up my weird, red-loving alley. I was impressed. The writing wasn't stellar, but I cared enough about the character pitches that I could see myself enjoying the story once it was further polished. But then I kinda forgot has been existed over the years. Not because I eventually soured on the pilot, but rather that it didn't fully hook me. Hell of a Boss, another series created by Vivzy Pop, had my interest during its first season, but lost me during season two, as the story focused less on the main characters and more on the unending drama between Blitz and Stolas. Look, I love me my problematic gays, but they can't be the only thing in the story for me to stick around and in turn, has been faded further from my mind. That was until the first episode of Has Been Hotel appeared in my recommended. I gave it a try and... <laughs> that bitch is halfway down the street. Is she? Oh, she's dancing. Oh, uh, no. There's a warm, fuzzy feeling that walks through the air. Girl, the way I was not expecting to love it the way that I did. The story structure felt so much stronger. The opening monologue made me care immediately for the plight of Hell's denizens and the story of Lucifer and Lilith. The presence of Adam and the Exorcist gave the story a much needed antagonistic force and sense of stakes and urgency to rocket the protagonist to action, and oh my god, the music was everything. It slaps! The more I watched, the more I felt enamored by its passion, by the scope of its vision, the beauty of its art, and the shameless messiness of its characters. The idea that, yes, the people here in hell are deeply flawed. Some of them are just outright monstrous and cruel. But Others do just need a second chance to make amends and a helping hand to face their problems head on. And maybe even if they're not seeking redemption, they're not fully bad people. They're people with their own goals, their own things to deal with. And many of them are surprisingly pleasant, loving people, provided, you know, you're in that group of people that they do give a shit about. I think especially with how many people have felt the need to remain morally pure and correct at all times in recent years, this approach has felt wonderfully refreshing. It's not about being perfect and never making a mistake. It's about trying your best and being true to yourself even if the systems in place deem you inherently evil for doing so. And yet, for many a reason to do with the show itself and its creator, and many I have not seen because I would literally rather die than go back on the Bird app or X or whatever the fuck it's called, Has Been Hotel has found itself incredibly polarizing online. People tend to either hate this show and condemn it to the deepest ring of hell like the angels, or they shamelessly adore its every facet, the way my short king Lucifer loves his ducks. Presenting the magic testicle backflipping rubber duck! <laughs> that spits fire! I would consider myself to be closer to the latter, but I do have some qualms with the show's execution for its first season, ones that I hope will be ironed out by the time the second season rolls around. And so today, we're going to talk about why I love Has Been Hotel, where it resonates with me, and where I feel it comes up short. Please remember that these are my own subjective feelings and opinions. I do not claim to speak for anyone but myself, and if you dislike my opinion, I mean, I, I, I don't... I don't really care what I we, I can't do anything about that. I'm not sure why you would be here in the first place then, but you know, pop off, sis. Before we begin, ciao. My name is Thomas, aka the Unicorn of War, and I am an author, writer, and YouTuber who makes video essays and reviews on whatever media I enjoy. From Avatar to Winx Club to Fairy Tale and the Tales series, I try to share my personal takes on why certain elements of media resonate with me and why others don't and I do my best to be subjective rather than objective these days, because life's too short not to revel in your feelings. If any of that sounds interesting to you, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications of new videos and community tab posts, because YouTube hates creators. You can also pledge your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon for extra rewards, including early access videos and exclusive content. Now, without further ado, let the chaos commence. 
As with any medium, a great musical uses its songs to effectively entrance the audience. It's not just having songs for the sake of it. It's using music's ability to get stuck in your head and to captivate the viewer emotionally to help tell the story, heightening emotional moments which advance the plot, and painting a portrait of a character's inner world at a pivotal or introspective moment. Not gonna lie though, I kind of forgot that Has Been was going to be a musical. Oh, holy shit! The songs in the pilot were fine. I completely forgot about the opening song used to try and introduce us to Hell, mostly because while it's trying to emotionally resonate, it doesn't do enough to get us invested in the story or clearly convey enough to get us to understand what is exactly happening. Like It just doesn't really work, at least for me. It tries to get you to care immediately, acting like you already do, without giving you enough to actually care about or giving you a reason to care. The main song, Inside Every Demon is a Rainbow, is the one that I remember more of, because it communicates Charlie's goal with the hotel. I remember even thinking it could work as a theme song with a bit of retooling. Ah, the way I miss theme songs in Western animation that pitch you the show's concept through a bop. While the new series lacks a theme song, it certainly does not lack in engaging musical numbers. Right off the bat, you get an I Want song from Charlie as she skips through the streets of hell, happily singing about redemption and dreams as the people around her scream in agony, insult her, or just go about their own sinful business in plain view. It's a happy day in hell. Hi, mister. Go fuck yourself. Especially with Disney being in the dumps lately, it is so nice to see a musical that fully embraces a Broadway approach, advancing the plot through its songs with bombastic, compelling numbers. Happy Day in Hell communicates Charlie's goal effectively and entertainingly. It does a wonderful job in endearing the audience to her innocence and earnestness, which is much needed considering the realm she's trying to help. Change their minds. And touch my parts. Uh, no thank you. It reminds me so much of 90s Disney animated movies specifically, the Renaissance era. That was truly the golden era of Disney, especially in regards to its music. And no doubt the Broadway cast is definitely helping in that regard. Admittedly, I don't know much about what went down when the cast was changed for full production, but uh... Please don't shoot me. I love this new cast. Everyone fits their role perfectly. The songs can easily stand on their own, most of them being high quality, certified bops. But equally, the songs embrace the fact that they are part of Has Been's story, helping us to learn about the characters, their goals, and their dynamics with each other. My favorite song of the show exemplifies this best, You Didn't Know. We know when a soul arrives. We know when they pass divine judgment. It is our job to ensure these souls are safe. But she was right, Sarah. As Sarah shuts down discussion on how heaven's hypocritical system denies the fact that Angel Dust is trying to become a better person, Emily begins to sing about how they're turning a blind eye to someone who is doing exactly what they say someone should do. It escalates with Charlie standing up to Sarah, Adam and Lute antagonizing her and accidentally revealing the extermination to the people of heaven, and ends with the reveal of Vaggie being an angel in a devastating moment that lives rent-free in my head. This song manages to hit so many beats and effectively communicate them, in the process creating one of the best moments of the entire show, and one of my favorite moments from anything, really. Charlie and Emily's duet as they read Heaven for Filth is is just one of my favorite things ever. I love this. When you make the wretched suffer just to kill them again. Now, this is how you advance the plot through your music, baking your character development, plot points, and conflicts into an engaging, memorable number. Also, the fact it does this while being a technical reprise of Hell is Forever, masterful chef's kiss, 11 out of 10. Thank you everyone who created this for me to obsess over. And speaking of Hell is Forever, excellent villain number. Hell is forever, whether you like it or not, had their chance to be like that or now they boil in the pot. I watched Cell Specs' review shortly before writing this and recording it, and I felt seen by so many of her points and critiques, highly recommend it. But I am with her in the fact that this is the best villain song since the Disney Renaissance. King Magnifico could fucking never. 
Adam is a terrible man, but that's what makes him such a compelling character as a villain. He's misogynistic, cruel, hypocritical, the list goes on. He's basically every shitty man who benefits from oppressive systems, believing his very existence makes him more worthy of praise and power, and gives him the right to be monstrous to people he views as inherently lesser. That's reflected in his number, backed by Heaven's hypocritical, unjust system. It's what enables him to have one of the best numbers in the entire show, the guitar riffs matching his screeches of how he looks forward to slaughtering sinners he sees as inferior to himself, and reflecting his disrespect towards the princess of a realm that he disdains. Another favorite is definitely Loser Baby, for both myself and the fandom as a whole. Having Husk meet Angel Dust where he is in a low, vulnerable moment, seeing these two let down their guards to commiserate, absolutely warms my heart. Well, let me just say you're correct. Sometimes you don't want to hear someone say that it'll get better or to crowbar in a silver lining. You just want validation that a situation sucks or is unfair, and to know that you aren't alone in that awful place. To have somebody sit there in the darkness with you to talk some shit. And respectless? But I'm that hashtag bitch and I will do nothing less than what I please. Woo! I'm the backbone of the vase. I was not expecting to love this one as much as I did, mostly because it's between two members of the supporting cast, which, uh... I have some thoughts on that we'll get to later, but it is an absolute earworm made better by Velvet and Carmilla's gorgeous voices. Especially love the use of Spanish guitar for Carmilla's numbers. I assume to pair with her Latina coding. You, you put Spanish guitar in anything, and I'm fucking sold. The way the song has Velvet confront Carmilla about the dead angel, poking and prodding her into the reaction that Velvet needs to confirm what she wants to know, is the height of using a song to emphasize conflict. Do you have a disclosure? This meeting's over! That was a productive meeting. Even if I feel these characters were not handled in the best way in terms of story structure, their duet is by far one of my favorite songs from the show. And more than anything, Oh my god. Looks like the apple doesn't fall far. Took you a while. I've missed that smile. I was not expecting the direction they went with Lucifer at all. This little depressed dork who loves rubber ducks and is a great inventor and visionary, but is so deeply depressed he just can't function. My daughter wants to see me. Take that! Depression. His little hey bitch when Charlie answers the phone is it sends me every fucking time. I love this man. Oh, this is the first time she's called you in years. This has to be perfect. Hey bitch! And I definitely wasn't expecting how surprisingly wholesome and positive the dynamic was between him and Charlie. After a long time of no communication at all, they bridge the divide between them to actually begin a relationship, coming to better understand and respect each other. And I love it so much. I'm grateful you're my daughter more than anything. To see Lucifer overcome his cynicism, inflicted by heaven, punishing him so harshly, to support Charlie's dream, really fucking warms my heart. And of course, Jeremy Jordan's vocals are... Ironically, a godsend in that regard. Ready as I'll ever be. Even songs I'm not as fond of do great jobs in endearing you to the characters. Like, it starts with sorry in beginning Serpentious Redemption arc. It starts with sorry. Or stayed gone in establishing the conflict between Vox and Alistair. He asked me to join his team. And naturally, the musical numbers are made spectacular by the bombastic, top-tier animation. Speaking of which... With my recent video on the live-action Avatar series, and learning about the production and history of Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, 
my lifelong adoration of animation has reached its zenith. Animation is an incredible medium that truly means the sky's the limit with what you can create. Even with a low budget, with enough ingenuity, those constraints can help to create something timeless, beautiful, and deeply compelling. And that is precisely why animation is the perfect medium for Hasbin's concept. It allows the show to fully embrace the fantastical, otherworldly qualities of heaven and hell, be it the permanent red pentagram sky of hell and the many eyes across its buildings to the golden clouds of heaven's metropolis marred by maroon and violet shadows. The spindly designs of the characters with wacky, exaggerated shapes that help to communicate their personalities adds to that fantastical flair. I am obsessed with how unashamedly stylized and cartoony has been Hotel is. This Disney-esque expressive style stands on its own when put next to its contemporaries, while also helping to provide something beautiful to behold in a story that really feels like it should not look this good. A live action has been just would not give you the same vibe that these spindly, colorful dweebs would, and would probably just be far more mundane with frames flooded in illegible darkness to the point you can't even fucking tell what's happening. There are some valid points about the art style, namely the fact that so many characters are similarly thin, along with the color palettes of the characters being shared along with the world that they inhabit. Vivzy Pop's style has also been critiqued for how busy the frames and designs tend to be. For me personally, none of these things bothered me. If anything, they kind of actually attributed to why I wound up loving it as much as I do. For one thing, I'd love me some tall, spindly designs that are very flowy. I can understand the annoyance that lack of diversity in body types, but that's also true of most animation, sadly, and most media, quite frankly, especially live action going for thinner, lighter skinned, more conventionally attractive actors most of the time. If you have this issue with has-been, you gotta be real in the fact that it's not a has-been problem. You have this issue with the systems that make this true for most media. But in terms of the color palette, I actually love how cohesive the characters and world feel as a result. To me, the characters don't really feel identical at all, instead feeling like they just belong with one another, with the repeated use of reds, whites, and yellows. Oh, and black, which, uh, wow, this is Loki how I wish Ruby kind of tackled its own use of color for the world and the characters. Heh. <laughs> Interesting. The list of better rubies increases. I just, I don't know what to tell you. I love a limited color palette and they took it to the nth degree here and I, I stand. I especially love how you can tell what realm someone is from just by looking at their palette and design. Heaven's characters tend more towards white and gold with some shades of blue and purple, especially for the seraphim. And the fact that the angels have golden blood? Yes. Fuck, that's probably why Lucifer's design is so much white, given he's still an angel, even if he's fallen. His white suit, the white and red wings, the little sneaky snake around his top hat, the apple staff, just... Yes! <laughs> oh, and I saw someone on Tumblr recently point out that the shape of his coat specifically resembles an apple core? See, that that's the kind of design shit that I fucking live for. And yes, I am about to be that person but I'm a big fan of the biblically accurate elements for the angel designs. Seriously, angels are horrifying creatures when you read the way that they actually appeared in scripture. And I love the fact that the show embraces that inhuman vibe, specifically the use of eyes all throughout their designs, along with the armillary sphere motif for even background angels, B I, I don't know what to tell you. I'm a sucker for armillary spheres. And the exorcists? I am obsessed with how monstrous they specifically are, using masks to hide behind anonymity, even someone like Adam trying to hide his face as he slaughters and condemns, with teeth as sharp and eyes as soulless as Alistair's, and fucking devil horns. It is not lost on me the fact that they often look like demons garbed in white and gold. Other random things I love, how fashionable velvet is and the shape of her hair, however it is stylized, and the fact it's like two, maybe even technically three-toned, yes. Wrist ruffles? Is it 1750? Burn it like the witches who wore it. I'm, I'm a fan that whenever pink gets brought into the palette, it's specifically this kind of red pink so that it remains cohesive with the rest of the colors, yes. The heart-shaped clouds of red smoke around Valentino, the way that they get turned into chains, and his coat being his giant moth wings wrapped around himself. <laughs> Vox's head being a flat screen TV with the little, you know, cute little top hat. And the fact he gets everywhere through circuits via turning into an electrical current. I have a fire to put out upstairs. 
yeah, good luck trying to pull off any of this in live action. I'm also a major fan of the character redesigns. They've been relatively simplified to make them easier to animate, as is standard. Charlie's fully red design with some white breaks on her chest and midriff make her pop way more, and her ponytail helps animators not have to worry about getting her hair shape exactly right in every frame, and to me, reads as more mature, more professional, and more stylish. And also adds contrast when she lets her hair down whenever she gets pissed for her demon form. Ooh, girl, I love that contrast. Alistair, Angel Dust, and Husk got some quality quality of life improvements as well, some more contrast in their designs, some removed details that would be a nightmare to animate consistently, but they've remained mostly the same. Alistair specifically is... D yes, d yes, I stand the strawberry pimp. I'm obsessed with his perpetual shark tooth smile and the fact that you have to rely on his eyes and eyebrows to discern his true emotions. What is it? Also, the little deer elements for his demon form, his pupils becoming radio dials, fucking excellent. I wouldn't try that, my dear. This face was made for radio. Vaggy got the biggest improvement, though. Before, her white outfit got lost in her hair, and her hair itself looked quite plain and boring. Now her hair features sharper, more triangular shapes with added contrast with the bits of purple to make it stand out more. And the addition of red and black into her outfit also keeps her body from getting lost in her hair. And for me, it fits her personality so much better. Even the simple visual storytelling present throughout, adding to the character personalities and physical comedy is an absolute highlight. It's a joy to see just how much passion was put into this project. It's at its best, though, in the musical numbers. They take full advantage of animation to go all in, momentarily creating entire dimensions for each line, each verse, and each chorus, and they make sure that you remember what the characters are going through as they sing. The music on its own is gorgeous, but paired with the animation, this is some top-tier content. Now, thus far, I've mostly talked about how the story is communicated musically and visually, because those are the avenues that has been excels in without question. Those are why the show is talked about as much as it is, not just by hardcore fans, but by casual fans. It is wild seeing how many people like me who weren't that interested in Vivzy's content before now got absolutely enchanted with Has Been once it properly dropped. That said, the writing is probably the weakest aspect here. Not to say the story itself is bad, far from it, but more so that there are some kinks that need to be worked out for next season, and they're not kinks that Angel Dust would be into. <laughs> As mentioned before, the show's premise is about redeeming sinners trapped in hell, only to discover that they're only here because heaven's system is broken and unable to acknowledge nuance and redemption. Charlie Morningstar, the princess of hell, opens the Hasbin Hotel to help sinners redeem themselves, then quickly realizes heaven will exterminate their souls permanently regardless of whether they try to improve themselves. This isn't exactly the angle that I was expecting, but I am fucking obsessed with it. I think a lot of queer people specifically can relate to these frustrations with religion, especially institutionalized religion. We're told that our very existence is sinful and wrong. And speaking as someone passively raised Catholic, yeah, you're kind of taught humans just suck inherently. It is a horrifyingly cynical, cruel view of people when you break it down. I actually remember getting into arguments about whether or not being a good person mattered compared to believing in the right God or even the correct version of God. For reference, I'm technically an atheist now, but not in the there is no God way. More so that I'm generally spiritual without subscribing to any one religion. If your religion brings you comfort, I'm happy for you. I just tend to believe it works sort of like a divine mirror ball and that people will find whatever works best for them. I only really have problems when people use their faith to try and dictate how others should live their lives. I say just try to be as kind and good as you can be and do your best to own up to your mistakes while standing up for people with less power in standing. Hasbin doesn't quite enter those waters, at least not yet. I'm no expert when it comes to the show's lore and I'd rather deep throat a cactus than read up on it via wikis. If it's important enough, 
put it in the damn show or I will kick your ass. But that said, I'm under the impression that there isn't exactly a God or Jesus in Hasbin's universe. Rather, this is a version of Abrahamic theology, the way that Disney's Hercules is a Disneyfied version of ancient Greece. But that said, we can kind of see that heaven parallels a lot of evangelical attitudes that condemn people who don't subscribe to their exact worldview, or that, well, are more just trying to live in a world that's very fucking difficult to live in. And I'm pretty sure they're homophobic too, giving Lute's comments on Charlie and Vaggie's relationship. Fuck you, Lute. Their love is vile and blasphemous. Hot as fuck, though. That all said, I wish the show delved more into these fucked up arbitrary views on who is worthy of crossing the pearly gates. There is an acknowledgement at the trial that Adam nor the heavenly court know what gets someone into heaven, and I am suspicious that Sarah herself doesn't seem that interested in it either, and I hope we dive more into that next season. None of you know what gets someone into heaven? This questioning stops now. But I'm really disappointed that for being the show's namesake, the Hasbin Hotel doesn't really seem to be the thing that the show is most interested in. All we get are team building exercises that, yes, are cute, and as Cell Specs points out, do a great job in showing how Charlie herself doesn't quite understand how people come to sin or wind up here in hell. I'm off to not have sexual intercourse before marriage! Yes! And yet, that process of realizing what landed the guests like Angel and Pentius in hell should have been the catalyst to realizing Heaven's system is broken, either not being able to understand the rules given their inconsistency or arbitrariness, or just deeming them flat out fucking unfair. That really feels like the core issue I have with this season. It's going for this great thesis with compelling themes about redemption, goodness, and injustice, but it's missing a lot of the crucial stepping stones, and instead leaping to fantastical moments across an abyssal void where the story should have been. Now, I do adore the characters. I've come to really adore most of them, even the supporting cast. But it does feel like, much like Hell of a Boss, Hasbin doesn't quite know how to prioritize. I understand many supporting cast members are important and compelling themselves, but there comes a point you have to realize there's a reason they aren't the protagonists. The protagonists should, nine times out of ten, always receive priority above the supporting cast and antagonists. They lead the story, they're taking charge, and they should be receiving development, character arcs, and the bulk of the screen time. Everyone else is optional. Yet it often feels like the protagonists, especially anyone who is not Charlie or Alistair, gets forgotten about to focus on whichever new character gets introduced that week. As much as I love the heaven plot, it honestly feels like the show tried everything it could to cram two seasons worth of events into just one. And maybe it's because they weren't sure if they would get another season? Still, I would have much preferred season one, focusing on just the protagonists, dedicating entire episodes to each of them, and telling the stories of how they went from Earth to Hell. Maybe investigating what exactly got them here so Charlie can help them, and in the process, learning just how much they deserved better than the way Heaven discarded them. The closest we get to that kind of approach is Angel's plot in episode 4, where we see the extent of the abuse he receives from Valentino. If I can ruin myself enough in the process, if I end up broken, I won't be his favorite toy anymore. And maybe he'll let me go. It is a difficult watch, but I'm also happy that they didn't shy away from just how awful and isolating that kind of experience is. Even so, it's just one episode and not the standard for all of them. Other episodes will spend much more of their runtime focusing on overlords and Hell's hierarchy, rather than giving us time to get acquainted with the people at the hotel. And the mention of Valentino brings me to another gripe. The Vs. Th they feel pointless as hell. The future of hell belongs to the Vs. <laughs> You could remove them, and most of the story just would not change, save for Angel's story with Valentino. It really feels like they should be antagonists, but they feel more like nuisances on the periphery. Which makes me sad, because they're so much fun, I love their designs, and I am a Velvet stan. Looks like you have everything under control here. Of course I do! Fuck you! Now shoo! Take care of the piss baby! 
Again, I'm a fan of the evil bitches, and I hope I get to watch Nifty skin Valentino. Oh, what the fuck? <laughs> For my collection. <laughs> if we were to save dealing with Adam and the Exorcist for season two, I would have enjoyed the V's being antagonists for season one. Their petty vindictiveness would allow for an escalation in stakes between seasons, with season one having the V's trying to interrupt the hotel's redemption process. Maybe Velvet could have beef with Charlie or Vaggie for some reason, I don't know. But you could have Valentino oppose the hotel for threatening to take Angel away from him, and Vox opposing it to get back at Alistair. And their power in hell could make us worry about them destroying the hotel's credibility and getting it shut down in a season finale. For what we got though, I do love the story, even for its flaws and fumblings. Even antagonists like Adam, Lute, and Sarah are compelling in their own right, with Adam being mean and misogynistic, Lute being cruel and sadistic, and Sarah just being contemptful and dismissive. But now, enough of that. On to our protagonists, who truly deserved better, because I love them. Now, I want to emphasize who gets considered a protagonist and why. The protagonist should be the characters at the helm of the story. The narrative follows them and their journey, with them having to make the big choices and their arcs being the most prominent. That's not to say other characters can't have great arcs or make important choices, but it's a question of priority. To me, the clear protagonist trio of Hasbin Hotel is Charlie, Vaggie, and Angel. Charlie is the one running the hotel who is trying to save her people. Vaggie is the supportive partner with her own reasons for trying to fix this system. And Angel is one of Hell's denizens who was failed by heaven. These three are the most important to the story's function, and as such, they should receive priority. Charlie herself is an excellent protagonist. Like many of her ilk, she's kind, naive, and innocent, seeing the best in people, even the damned ones. This place is about second chances, and who deserves one more than this? Slithery, slippery, special little man. But she isn't unbearably sweet. Instead, she's earnest, doing her best to stand up for people and give them a chance to help themselves. And I think her passion in trying to save the people of her realm is what elevates her to something great. Sinners made mistakes, sure, but everyone makes mistakes. Angels don't make mistakes. You really think that? She's an honest soul taking on an unjust, broken system that is openly cruel and condescending. And that provides her with an underdog role that makes her incredibly easy to root for. Honestly, I think Charlie is what a lot of people aspire towards. To be a kind, strong person who wants to make the world a better, fairer place. Vaggie honestly was not that compelling to me before the big twist with her being a fallen angel. It's one of those cases I mentioned in my Korra video about her team avatar, where characters have to be more than just supporting another person. They need their own goal and motivation, their own reason for engaging in the plot. And up until that reveal, I could not get a read on Vaggie's goal at all, aside from girlfriend. I'm supposed to make your dreams a reality. I'm supposed to protect you. If I can't help you, what's the point of me? Sure, she and Charlie are super cute and we love sapphic rep, but Vaggie needed more than just a desire to help her girlfriend. The addition of her being an angel whose wings were torn and eye ripped from her skull because she spared a damned child adds much needed complexity to her character. She sees how unjust what she and the exorcists have been doing is, and in turn, that explains her desire to help Charlie, and likely why she admires Charlie's passion so much. And Angel? My spider boy needs hugs and protection. I'm not sure why he's here, the easiest guess being that in this universe, homophobia is in power. You know, like how it is on Earth. Oh god. He blew his shot like the cocks in his mouth. In which case, some calling out of Heaven's prejudice would be very welcome, as well as Charlie murdering Adam and Lute for their slut shaming and their condemnation of sex work. Honestly, I am no expert in these kinds of topics, but I would love to see the show tackle our culture's hypocritical views of sexuality, how we villainize and demonize sex workers, and in the process callously throw them into harm's way. I don't know if Angel would be doing this work without Valentino's contract forcing him to, but I think that's definitely something worth exploring. Really, it's just sad seeing Angel break down in episode four, admitting he acts the way that he does as a defense mechanism to survive what he's put through. Cut the act. It's not an act. It's who I need to be. So seeing him be able to be vulnerable with Husk is heartwarming. Alistair, 
is a bit of a wild card. He's in a protagonistic role right now, helping Charlie in the hotel, but his goal to escape the mysterious deal that he's trapped in, along with his questionable motivations, mean he could eventually shift into an antagonistic role. Big talk for someone who's also on a leash. <laughs> what did you say? He's still important, but not in the same way that the trio is. Now, I don't trust Alistair one goddamn bit. But I do fucking love him. I guess that's why Charlie called it the Has Been Hotel. Ha ha ha! It was actually my idea. Ha ha ha! Well, it's not very clever. Ha ha! Fuck you. He reminds me a lot of Zelos from Slayers, an anime which I must talk about at some point because it's fucking iconic. Basically, Zelos is a kind of monster or demon who occasionally accompanies the protagonists, but only when their goals align with his own, which he is always obnoxiously cryptic about. Zelos can appear charming or friendly. He's very much a trickster. But the moment Zelos goals no longer match up with the protagonists, he will turn on them no questions asked, even entertaining the idea of ruthlessly killing them. But aren't you supposed to be Miss Lena's friend? No, I simply travel with Miss Lena's party because their objectives often overlap with my own. Alistair is much the same. He has his own agenda, at times amicable, but only when it suits whatever he's up to. It's clear he's a lover of chaos, but it's even clearer that he wants freedom from whatever deal he's under at any fucking cost. I won't hurt anyone for you. Who's asking? One favor at a time of my choosing where you harm no one. In return, I tell you what I know. Do we have a deal? I actually really like the mystery of who this deal is with and who owns Alistair's soul, but I absolutely love the fact that it means that at some point he's gonna do whatever he can to break free of it even if it hurts Charlie or the others at the hotel. At some point, he's going to pull the rug out from underneath them, and it's going to be tragic, but something we all knew was coming. Kind of like an iceberg of good character drama, but make it red. Husk and Nifty, meanwhile, I would argue are more supporting characters. Husk is there as a bartender to talk people through their issues, most notably Angel. I just saw someone self-destructing. It seems like, I don't know. You might need a bartender to talk to. He has his own story, but I would argue it's not as important to the narrative as Angel's. I wasn't expecting to love Husk as much as I do, nor become a Husker dust shipper. But here we are. But just maybe if we eat shit together, things will end up differently. Thank you, Keith David. Also, I'm a sucker for Husk's design. His wings and his gambling motif with his throwing cards and explosive dice. Luxord wishes he was this iconic, as I still pronounce it Luxord, fight me. Nifty, meanwhile, well, she's kind of there, just mostly for fucked up comedy and to be the mascot. The bad boy is back. <laughs> Never leave me again. 80% sure she's harmless. And I love her for it. She is my chaotic little gremlin, but a complex character she is not. And I'm okay with that. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of clear that I have a lot of feelings about Has Been Hotel, most of them positive. It is far from perfect with some sloppy writing choices and an art style that's not everyone's cup of tea. But I think for its problems, it more than makes up for them in its uniqueness, its boldness, and its commitment to its greater vision. And its fucking songs, they slap. I'm beyond excited to see where the story goes from here. And until season two arrives, Trust that I will be standing short King Lucifer. Take that depression! Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications of new videos because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider pledging your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon. I'm the Unicorn of War, and heaven's, heaven's a shit show, oh my god.